judges and justices to the Supreme Court and the lower courts than any Republican president ever. So, you know, you know, I have to push back a little bit. We've already talked about Chief Justice Roberts' decision in DACA. Chief Justice Roberts is an appointee of George W. Bush, not of Donald Trump, but still he's meant to be more or less conservative. But this brings us to Neil Gorsuch, who Donald Trump appointed to replace the sainted Antonin Scalia. And Gorsuch writes this opinion in Bostock a few weeks ago in which he holds that 1964 legislation, which is legislation to prevent gender discrimination, extends to gay marriage and transgender discrimination, even though those as categories did not exist and did not even were not even thinkable in 1964. He produces this this opinion, which is long and very closely reasoned. And you go into the top and I don't have a sharp enough legal mind to find exactly where he goes wrong. But even I know that when you come out at the bottom, you're in a crazy place. You're just in a crazy place. Ted Cruz, this judicial rewriting of our law short circuited the legislative process and the authority of the electorate. Close quote. That's the kind of language conservatives used to use on Chief Justice Earl Warren. And yet Ted Cruz is now using it on your man, Trump's man, Neil Gorsuch. He's not my man. He's Trump's man. I actually don't know why Trump doesn't put Ted Cruz on the Supreme Court. I told it. I completely agree with Senator Cruz's description of the opinion. Oh, you do. Yeah. All I can say, all I can say is nobody's perfect. Even Scalia got some things that I thought were badly mistaken, like his decision as Smith about the rights of religious groups for freedom of religion, which causes enormous problems even today. And I think Gorsuch, the thing is, I think he was wrong. I agree with you. You know, he was quite taken with this kind of law school classroom hypothetical about, well, we don't need to get into it, but just about how Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act worked and whether it discriminated on gender. But I can't think of another one that he's gotten badly wrong. And I can't think of one that Kavanaugh's gotten badly wrong on all the important constitutional issues so far. It hasn't been Gorsuch and Kavanaugh giving the fifth vote to liberals. It's been Chief Justice John Roberts. A Bush appointee, I have great hopes for. I thought he would be great. I think that he's the one who's actually become this sort of rudderless fifth vote in the middle, who's the one who, right, he joined Justice Gorsuch's opinion in Boston. He's the one who provided the fifth vote to strike down Trump's effort to end DACA. He's the one who provided the fifth vote on the Louisiana abortion case to strike down Louisiana's law. So he's the one who was the fifth vote in the census case from last year. Justice Gorsuch fell victim to temporary insanity. The Chief Justice is in systematic error at this point. I think so. So let me ask this question, John. The larger point about the court, but it's directly related to your argument about the two views of the Constitution or the two views of governance. President Trump relied for his nominees, and you know this in great detail, on, among other institutions, the Federalist Society, which is an organization of conservative or originalist legal minds. You're a member. It's headed by someone we both know called Leonard Leo, who is as brilliant a mind as you can imagine. And they come up with these list of nominees. And as you argued, that overall, it's just amazing. Not only do they find enough originals, but they find enough intellectually distinguished originals. These are people of real accomplishment. All right. Even at that, Gorsuch goes, gives us a lousy decision. Even the Federalist Society, not as active as it is now, but George W. Bush, his administration, in which you served, is consulting them as well. And we end up with Chief Justice Roberts, whom we agree is in systematic error. Why is it that it is only ever conservative or originalist judges who drift to the left and never, ever, ever liberal judges who move to the center or to the right? 
Well, I first, I agree with your data. Only, we can only think of one Democrat appointed justice who might have moved to the middle. That was Byron White. And actually he was pretty conservative and he, the country just changed around him. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. And on the Republican appointed justices has moved to the little, you know, you run out of fingers on your hands. You've got John Paul Stevens, Harry Blackman, you could go on. Then you have Sandra Day O'Connor, Anthony Kennedy, who were in the middle, but were probably voting more liberal, more than they were conservative by the end. So the question is why, what's the cause of that data? So I have to defer to the views of my former employer and your friend, Judge Warren Silberman on the DC circuit. He gave a great speech about 20 years ago, trying to explain why this was happening. And he said, well, you know, the New York Times is Supreme Court reporter for many, many years was a woman named Linda Greenhouse. And he said, well, if you uphold Roe versus Wade, or you strike down something that the Reagan administration wanted, you're going to be failure. The New York Times pages are going to be filled with praise for you for growing in office and becoming a judicial statesman. And you'll be invited to fancy seminars in Europe, and you'll be judging moot courts at all the best law schools. So Judge Silberman said, I'd like to call that the real greenhouse effect. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. The cultural institutions, media institutions, academic institutions are very much on the left. And if you are conservative justice and you evolve, quote unquote, to the middle, you are going to receive the praise and support of all those institutions. It's almost like a hydraulic effect, constantly pushing a point. So what Judge Silberman said was that only people who really have already been attacked, who've been Washington veterans or been in political high stakes fights, would be people immune to the greenhouse effect. But if you pick people from out in the hinterlands who don't have a lot of experience in politics, who don't know what it's like to be attacked and to survive, they're the ones who are going to be the most vulnerable to this kind of insidious form of praise, he said. That's the only thing I can think of. All right. So it's human nature. It's not legal philosophy. It's human nature. People want to be liked. Unlike you and me. Yeah. People generally like to be liked. All right. Impeachment. Defender in chief. House Democrats set a speed record in investigating the Ukraine affair. Democrats were immediately convinced that Trump's quid pro quo justified a rush process to force his removal from office. Close quote. This is just amazing because it's impeachment, which is a major event constitutionally and only took place a few months ago. It says something about the time we live in that it's as though it happened a decade ago. You're going to have to remind us the Ukraine matter. Just give us a brief praising. What was it? Give us a statement of facts, Mr. You. The Ukraine matter. And what was the quid pro quo? The verdict is rendered in end of January, early February. It's not long ago, but yes, it does seem because of the pandemic that it's receded from our memory. But remember, this is all about a phone call in between in the summer of 2019, just last year ago from now, where President Trump had allegedly called the president of Ukraine and said, could you see if there's some kind of dirt you could dig up on Joe Biden? We really that would be really helpful to us. And then the claim was President Trump then held up money appropriated by Congress to go to Ukraine as foreign aid. And that was the quid pro quo. Whether that was true or not. And so, you know, this is a common thing you see in the law where you say accepting the facts to be true, which I'm not. But if I were to accept the very effective argue, very effective argument technique that works on everyone other than my wife and my mother. But accepting the facts to be true. Is that really a high crime and misdemeanor? Is that really why the framers put the impeachment power in the Constitution? Or is this more, you know, a dispute, more of a run of the mill dispute? And so part of the argument in the book is, again, this goes back to the beginning of your questions, the Electoral College. Again, the founders did not want the president to be subject to the control of Congress. Now, even though the president wasn't picked by Congress, the framers also knew that if you could fire someone, you could control them. That's a fact. The reason why you're fired is not just Trump's favorite tagline, but it is the way the president really controls the executive branch. 
so too with impeachment. If the Congress can fire the president, the framers were worried that Congress would control the executive and create that merger of the two branches they feared. And so they didn't want impeachment used, I think, for simple foreign disputes or even, again, accepting the facts to be true, minor abuses of power. They wanted to be used for things like treason, for bribery. And we're talking about bribery of foreign nations by of a president. They had in mind the friend, the King Louis XIV bribing the English king, which did happen. And that's what they talked about in the ratification. And they were worried that if they made it too easy to impeach, that Congress would be running the whole show. And instead, they said, that's why we're going to make the vote requirement to remove a president, to be two thirds of the Senate, to make sure that impeachment is not a partisan affair, that it's not a matter of interest groups out to get the president. And instead, what is the cure? Well, the cure is what we're seeing now. It should be the framers very clear. It should be elections. If people believe if the House finds enough evidence and they put out an impeachment report and the people agree, then they should use the ballot box to remove that president and make their view. So I argue in the book is that the Constitution expects the people to run to the verdict in November. So your judgment is that the Senate was certainly correct to acquit. As also that the House was wrong to indict. Yes, because I don't think it met the standard of high crime and misdemeanor. Right. Trump, I'm quoting Defender in Chief, Trump may have acted inappropriately or even abused the executive power over foreign affairs, but Democrats could not show that the Ukraine affair had seriously harmed the nation. Indeed, when all was said and done, the Trump administration had provided greater aid and support to Ukraine than the Obama administration. All right. That's not a high crime or misdemeanor. I don't think so. If it is, then Congress has the president under their thumb. All right. That's what the framers did not want. Last questions. Defender in Chief, if friends had told me on January 21st, 2017, the day the man is sworn in, that I would write a book on Donald Trump as a defender of the Constitution, I would have questioned their sanity. I had not voted for Trump in the 2016 primary or general elections. His many personal and professional flaws repelled me. Repelled me. Strong language, John. I saw him as a populist, even a demagogue. Boy, was I wrong. Trump campaigns like a populist, but governs like a constitutional conservative. Close quote. I hate being honest. It is the worst. John, where does it come from? The case you make is actually very dramatic. The argument for a permanent state for rule by experts is so powerful that it has infected the thinking of Chief Justice Roberts, that it has taken over the entire Democratic Party so that it's now a centrist position in the Democratic Party, as articulated by Hillary Clinton, that we should do away with the Electoral College. The FBI, the CIA, I think the CIA was in on it. That's not clearly established, but surely James Comey is saying, is saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm an independent actor. I'm an expert. I know how Washington should be run. Trump is out of line. I don't care whether he won the election. I'm above the election. This is deeply ingrained and very powerful. And along comes 